Thank you so much for seeing me, doctor. I've been getting this sharp pain behind my shoulder whenever I... Yeah, pain really sucks. Well, at first I thought it was maybe... Um, do you mind if I ask what you're eating? Marijuana gummy worms. Do you know, I've been practicing medicine for 30 years, and recently I heard about this thing called medical marijuana. <laughs> it really makes my day... It just flies by. What did you say? I beg your pardon, doctor? I thought you said something. Look, I would offer you one of these, but the way I understand it, there are these really strict rules on medical marijuana. Like, only the doctor can have it. That's actually the opposite of the way Well, it... look at that rainbow! It's filling the whole room. That's beautiful. I didn't see I any... I sometimes wonder what the color blue would taste like. I bet it would taste like a lake. You know, doctor, I have another appointment. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I wanted to show you something. Here, if you get down on the floor and you crawl over here to the wall, look at that. It's an electrical outlet, but you can't see the holes. It's like, it's like there's a layer of ice over them. That's just a child safety outlet plug. They're actually very common child and... Child safety? No, someone is clearly messing with my outlets. There's an inlet in my outlet. It could be, I don't know, it could be the government. It could be, what if there's like some kind of society underneath this outlet? Or is it a lake with ice over it? Wow, look at the time. Gotta go. You don't want some medicine for that sinus inf... It was a sinus infection, right? Maybe I have a sinus infection. And now, I forgot what I was going to say. Yeah, you were supposed to introduce me, uh, Colin McEnroe, and welcome to the show. We're going to be talking about medical marijuana today. Let me tell you, first of all, who's here. We've got a great panel today. Uh, James In studio with me uh, are James Feeney, Director of Trauma and Surgical Research at St. Francis Hospital and Medical Center, uh, Godfrey Perlson, Director of the Olin Neuropsychiatry Research Center, Institute of Living, Hartford Hospital and Healthcare, Professor of Psychiatry and Neuroscience at Yale, I have to take like extra breaths for this. Chair of Research Society on Marijuana and member of the Connecticut Department of Public Health Medical Marijuana Board of Physicians, advising Governor Malloy. Uh, joining us by phone, uh, Suzanne Sisley, uh, internist and president of Scottsdale Research Institute in Arizona and former clinical assistant professor uh, at University of Arizona a College of Medicine. And also joining us by phone, uh, Stacy Gruber, director of the Cognitive and Clinical Neuroimaging Core, uh, director of psychiatry. Uh, oh, Excuse me, Director of, Ma Ma of Marijuana Investigations for the Neuroscientific Discovery and Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Well, that's all we have time for. The show's over, but thanks for tuning in. No, it's just that people have very long titles. Um, so I'm going to begin, I think, by um, – we have a lot of things we want to talk about today. I guess maybe one of, some of the overarching questions we want to get into is – why is it so hard to study medical marijuana? Why is it so hard to study marijuana in general? In some ways, after a century of foot dragging about marijuana, you could sort of argue that now uses of mar medical uses of marijuana may outpace slightly our understandings of the risks and benefits of marijuana. So we want to know more about how it works and maybe instances in which it's not the best answer, but we don't necessarily have the ways to investigate this the way we would with other kinds of drugs. There are certain things about marijuana, obviously, about its history and its status uh, as a scheduled uh, substance at the federal level that make it hard to study the things that are vital to know. I think that's one of the main themes of today's show. But none of this will make any sense unless each one of the guests kind of gives us the elevator pitch for uh, what they're studying. So, uh, James Feeney, I'm going to have you start. Um, what's your area of investigation right now? So, uh, I am the director of trauma over at St. Francis Hospital in Hartford. And our area of study, and I, I believe it's probably the first, if not one of the first of its kind in the country, is we're looking at marijuana for pain control for acute pain. So we're talking about people who have broken ribs in particular, uh, but later we'll, we'll probably expand that to other fractures. Um, I don't know that anyone else is really studying that, but there's a little bit of data, actually it's a pretty fair amount of data, looking at marijuana use for chronic pain, people who've had pain syndromes for a long period of time, and also for uh, pain related to cancer. And we, we sought to sort of kind of usurp some of that data to uh, uh, get our study underway, looking at people who've been injured. All right. So let's stay in the studio here. Godfrey Perlson, uh, what's your primary investigative uh, 
trail that you're following? Uh, so w- there are really three separate things that we're looking at. W- one is a completed study of alcohol and marijuana use in Connecticut students that we did at CCSU in Trinity, where we just followed freshmen for two years with MRI scans and EEGs um, to look at people's drug use and its impact on their college grades. Second study is from the National Institute on Drug Abuse that's giving us a grant to look at the neuroscience of marijuana impaired driving. So we have people that we give acute doses of marijuana in a double-blind fashion to have them drive inside of an MRI scanner uh, and on driving simulators. The the third study is from the National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration that's paying us to develop roadside, curbside tests of um, field sobriety for marijuana-impaired driving. All right. So uh, now let's go to the phones. Um, Stacey, uh, what are you studying right now? So um, we actually have uh, two sort of programs developed here at McLean Hospital. One, uh, I've spent a little more than 20, 20, too many years to mention, looking at the impact of recreational cannabis or marijuana on uh, cognitive function, brain structure, brain function, and other measures using some neuroimaging techniques and and, uh, offline and clinical diagnostic measures. And more recently, about two and a half years ago, we started the Marijuana Investigations for Neuroscientific Discovery program designed to look specifically at the impact of medical cannabis or medical marijuana use on things like cognitive performance, which had never been done before, clinical state, quality of life, all the same types of measures, including neuroimaging, in individuals before they began using, and then we follow them over a period of a minimum of one year. We have a couple of other programs um, that are being supported through MIND as well, but basically designed to look at the impact um, of medical cannabis on a number of different areas of function, All right. including driving simulations. Okay, so yeah, I, I want to. Uh, driving is something I think we really want to talk about with a couple of these investigators. Uh, so, Sue, uh, you're last but not least. Uh, tell us what you're looking into right now. Sure. Um, we're doing a triple blind randomized controlled trial looking at four different varieties of whole plant cannabis in military veterans that have post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is an FDA phase two trial, and um, we should have, we're we're currently enrolling veterans in the study, and it'll take about two years to complete, so we should have published data in three years. And we're also in the middle of getting approval for for another um, controlled trial looking at cannabis as uh, substitution therapy for opioid dependence. All right. So there's obviously some uh, intersection between what you're doing and what James uh, is doing, uh, and yeah. we'll come to that. Sue, so, so while I've got your, get you, uh, got your attention right now, because um, uh, I want to have all the researchers talk about this, but uh, it sounds like that what you're doing is a highly controlled trial. Some of the trials we're talking about are more what they call observational trials. Um, the difference here in the world of marijuana would be that you have to use a certain kind of approved and standardized marijuana, whereas maybe Stacy with some of her studies can actually have people get their own marijuana and then test it and look at it and learn a little bit more about what it is that they're using. I want to talk about both of those things, but Sue, uh, you and uh, and I think Godfrey are uh, at times at least in the same bind, right? You you can really only use one kind of research marijuana, and it can o- and there's only one place that that makes it available. So this is something people don't know about. Tell people about uh, the marijuana from Ole Miss. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, University of Mississippi has held the monopoly since 1968 on the only federally legal supply of cannabis for um, research and controlled trials. And um, yeah, so if the University of Mississippi doesn't uh, isn't able to grow the certain phenotype that you want, then um, you, you you'll have to adjust your protocol to accommodate what they can um, cultivate. So. It's been, um, you know, it's been challenging, but, we're, you know, we're grateful to have any legal drug supply to use for controlled trials. So I'm not denigrating them, but I think it, at some point we, we have to see the government um, make good on their announcement. I don't know if you remember last yeah. summer the DEA announced that they would be licensing other growers for research, which is something that we've been pushing for for many years, and we were so grateful to hear the DEA um, you know, notify the public that this would happen, but unfortunately there hasn't been any movement yet toward that goal, and the DEA didn't announce any timeline associated with that, um, with, with that um, 
you know, with, with the the idea of licensing other growers didn't come with any timetable. So we're not sure when it'll happen, if it will happen in time. Right now, you know, for phase three trials, you're not allowed to use cannabis from University of Mississippi. NIDA, you know, cannabis from the National Institute on Drug Abuse is not allowed to be used for um, drug development studies in phase three. It can only be used in phase one and phase two. So that's a challenge we have it for researchers that want to do work in phase three. They won't have a drug supply to utilize. Um, so um, Godfrey, uh, she's a nice person, so she doesn't want to denigrate the old Miss uh, marijuana that has uh, a monopoly on research. Can we denigrate it a little bit? I mean, in the uh, reading that I've done about it, it indicates that it doesn't really resemble very much the marijuana that I would get from a medical dispensary here in Connecticut or that I would buy from my friendly neighborhood uh, supplier of marijuana in a less legal form, right? This is... It's its own little thing, and the idea that it's going to bear a resemblance to real-life marijuana use seems slim to me. So this was true until about 18 months ago, mm. where if you ordered marijuana from Mississippi and Mohammed El Souli, who's the physician in charge, you get pre-rolled cigarettes, so basically government joints. And these things were rather poorly dis- put together. So after a month, the can would be full at the bottom of marijuana residue, these things would fall apart. It looked like the joints had been attacked by a band of manic weasels. They were very poorly constructed. But um, in the last 18 months, if you order floral marijuana, basically herb marijuana, um, there's now an extensive menu of different kinds, um, different concentrations of THC, different concentrations of cannabidiol. So what we're able to get for our studies, the highest dose available of THC, which is 14%. And this arrives as what would look like a bud that you bought at your dispensary that's been through a spice grinder. But it's it's less stems than... Um, <laughs> It, it, it looks better than it used to. I'd put it that way. Although, Sue, I don't know. I read in some other places that it... So in, maybe this is pre-18 months ago, but that it had lead in it, it had mold in it, and sometimes people dropped out of studies just because it was so nasty. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it, what we discovered through the process. We've done secondary testing on the cannabis from University of Mississippi, and um, what we discovered is that they um, don't test for mold, for instance. Apparently, that hasn't been part of their testing protocol, um, and yet that's something we require in most all of the other medical, you know, the state level medical cannabis. Uh, programs around the country that they're all required to make sure their mold levels are below a certain threshold. So I'm not sure, um, you know, it, like I said, the, the study drug may not be ideal, but it's the only supply that we have. And hopefully this, you know, information coming to light about um, NIDA cannabis will put, uh, you know, will push the DEA to finally move forward on licensing other growers. It's not just about the, the quality of the kit's really more about the diversity of phenotypes, the mm-hmm. fact that we don't, you know, if you want, if you're a scientist that wants to study unique cannabinoids like THCV or CBN or CBG, it's really tough to get um, NIDA to be able to grow these sort of unique phenotypes that aren't currently available on the menu on the NIDA website. So, Stacey Gruber, one way to um, get some of these unique phenotypes is to ask people just to bring in whatever they had in the top drawer of their br- bedroom uh, bureau in the first place. Uh, and I, my, my sense is that that's some of the kind of observational studies that you've done, that you've had people bring in their marijuana and then just tested it to figure out what it is? So that's part of what we've done. In the large-scale observational study of the medical marijuana patients, that's one thing we do. We have, as Sue and, and Godfrey appropriately point out, you know, we have this single source. We also um, are, we, we have an approved clinical trial by the FDA, but we're clinically, we're currently on hold with it um, because of a sourcing issue. So, yeah, one one mechanism that you can utilize is you have individuals submit product samples. That is, let's say they're most commonly used two or three samples for analysis. And what you find very quickly, and we've seen this with our recreational and consumers as well, is that, you know, again, Godfrey pointed out the max potency of THC, for example, is 14%. Most often we're seeing, um, you know, THC potency levels significantly higher than that. 
and we see a very wide range of other cannabinoids, which are critically important for lots of different indications, as Sue appropriately points out, which makes our lives a little more frustrating. Um, the importance of being able to you know, isolate individual cannabinoids with specific ratios, again, not just the two main players of THC and CBD, but others that are likely to really affect a change is, is critical. So you have this sort of observational mandate where, you know, you don't really have much choice if you want to um, sort of study what people are actually taking for external validity purposes, um, but you're limited in terms of what you can do with clinical trial models. And Godfrey's right, NIDA's expanded their drug supply portfolio exponentially. Um, James, James Feeney, you're doing pretty much the same thing, right? At least with some of your studies, um, studying what people actually do use as opposed to what NIDA gives you? Uh, actually, no. Oh, okay. a- actually, we're not. What, okay. we're, what we're doing is we're putting people out into the dispensary system okay. here in Connecticut. And, and the dispensary system in Connecticut is, is very, very medicalized. It's, it's not quite like, uh, I think, the other sources of marijuana. There really isn't the menu um, per se, what we're, what we're doing is we're, we're kind of limiting people to one or two elements that they can use uh, from the dispensary system. Uh, essentially, everybody's starting with a pill. Mm-hmm. We're not, nobody's smoking anything. There's no vaping. Uh, there's no oils. There's no buds. Um, everybody's starting with a pill. And we have a very defined escalation protocol, but it's all going through the dispensary system. And that was part of our approval from the state is that we could put these people through the dispensary system without one of the 22 predefined conditions. You know, um, Godfrey, one of the things that happened last year, uh, one of our other guests mentioned it. Okay, so there was this kind of almost sort of compromise. One of the problems is that marijuana is a Schedule One drug. I mean, it is, it's classified with like heroin and stuff like that. So, um, so they didn't change that classification. There was some hope that maybe they would. The compromise was that they, um, as I think Sue pointed out, they, they sort of nominally said, well, we'll open up the process. It won't just be Ole Miss. Other people can get into the game. Is part of the problem, and I, this is necessarily something you would know the answer to, but it would seem to me that if it's still Schedule One, if it's still you know a, a drug that the federal government frowns upon at a criminal level, for me to go to my dad and say, can I borrow $40 million to start up some research strains of this drug that has this highly problematic and double-edged status in society? I mean, I would imagine getting people to invest in creating research marijuana might be kind of complicated. Yes, so there's a, a disconnect. On the, on the one hand, people say, well, medical marijuana is prescribed for or used for a variety of conditions, but most of the evidence is anecdotal to date. Mm-hmm. Th- and th- then on the other hand, the government discourages um, research into marijuana for beneficial purposes. They're happy to fund uh, things like cannabis-impaired driving, but much less likely to fund anything that has to do with a, a Schedule One substance. And um, th- that's not likely to be resolved anytime soon. And then the other thing is the legal issue. Since at a, a federal level, marijuana is still an illegal drug, despite what states have mandated, that is another disconnect. So if you, your hypothetical person in, invested their large amount of money, the feds may come and raid them at any time. And that's uncertainty discourages research. You know, Sue, I feel like I read lots of clinical research where they're studying, I don't know, mushrooms or LSD or uh, MDMA or something. Is it, I mean, is even within the, the universe, the smaller universe of Schedule One drugs, is marijuana harder to study? I I will say yes. I mean, my study sponsor, MAPS, is a pretty well-known nonprofit that does um, an immense amount of psychedelic research, and studying MDMA has been much easier for us than studying cannabis. We're already in phase three trials with um, MDMA for PTSD, but we're just now starting, um, you know, looking at cannabis for PTSD in in an early phase two trial um, and this trial has taken us almost seven years to get underway, and it doesn't work that way for MDMA or LSD or any of the other drugs in Schedule One. And I would um, argue that's primarily because of this DEA monopoly. It, it's also because of uh, there were other hurdles along the way, like uh, a public health service review that which a uh, redundant unnecessary review that occurred after we'd already received FDA approval that took us three years to get through and didn't even require any protocol changes afterwards. But um, those were the kind of things that were impeding 
cannabis research um, over the last few decades. Unfortunately, Public Health Service review has now been eliminated, um, partly because of our, you know, the onerous experiences of scientists. And then um, this DEA monopoly, once that gets dismantled, hopefully that will lead to kind of a renaissance of cannabis research in this country. Um, Stacey, I feel like, you know, as just going through the notes for this show and the work that our producer Betsy Kaplan did on this, I felt like I was experiencing this really kind of odd catch-22. In, in some ways, like I read about your research and, well, let me let me do it the other way around. Uh, you know, uh, you, we want to know more about how marijuana works, what it does, what its efficacy is in, in certain medical treatment kind of contexts, in clinical contexts. Um, we also want to know what the risks are versus the benefits. Uh, we want to know a lot about how marijuana acts on the brain. So it would be a lot easier to do that if it wasn't a Schedule One drug or maybe if it was legal or whatever. Um, on the other hand, I read about some of the research that you and Godfrey are doing Doing, and I think, wow, that sounds like a drug that probably shouldn't be legal, or at least I have some real trepidation about that if it's going to have long-term effects on, on the brain. Do you, do you understand the, the, the contradiction I'm struggling with? Sure. I think it's the same issue that, you know, lots of our adolescents and emerging adults face when, you know, they're, they're asked, look, do you think it's risky to use cannabis or marijuana? And they say, no, how could it be risky? Because my mother's best friend uses it for X, Y, or Z. It's a complicated picture, and there are very large differences between the use of marijuana or cannabis for recreational versus medical um, indications, perhaps. And that's one of the things that we're seeing in you know, these studies that are, are being done sort of simultaneously it gives us a really unique perspective. But yeah, it is a catch-22. Um, as, as somebody mentioned, there's largely only anecdotal data so far about the impact of medical cannabis or medical marijuana. Do we expect the same negative effects that we've sometimes seen in studies of recreational, chronic heavy recreational users in particular? Um, our you know, small sample size is absolutely clear, but um, we have some interesting data suggesting that we may not see the same decrements. In fact, people look like they're doing better after treatment. How do they look over longer periods of time remains to be seen. So we have to, we have to sort of keep an open mind and continue to follow these folks. But it's a great question. Um, you know, it's critical to figure out what we can. And marijuana is not just one thing, which also makes the study of it so difficult. MDMA, you know, you create it in a lab and it's a different story from cannabis, which contains hundreds of constituents, some of which, you know, are, are critical and interact with our own endocannabinoid system. So it's, it's a complicated picture. James Feeney, one thing that we do know is like, okay, now, right now, if I break my arm, I break my leg, uh, I, I go to, you know, either one of your hospitals, yours or Godfrey's hospital, uh, or UConn, uh, and I'm in a ton of pain, or if I have to have some surgery on the leg or after the break or whatever, uh, and I'm really in a ton of pain, I'm going to get opioids. And if you've had access to a TV set or radio or a newspaper for the last two years, you know we're having an opioid, opioid crisis. It's dangerous. It's lethal. It would seem like this would be an area where, you'd get a lot of space to explore if people were thinking rationally about it. Are people thinking rationally about it? Yeah, I, I honestly don't think people are thinking all that rationally about it. I, I, your point is a really good one. I mean, yes, this is a Schedule One drug, and yes, there are going to be some side effects that we have yet to determine. But, I mean, we have a ton of experience in our society. I think individuals have a lot more experience than the medical community does looking at what the side effects of marijuana are. Uh, are over long periods of time. And I think that's a, a fair point worth making is that a lot of the brain chemistry changes and the brain structural changes have been studied in patients with heavy recreational use. The occasional user is not really studied because the differences won't be that stark. So I don't think we really know from a medical standpoint, you know, what this is going to turn out to be. But to your point, um, Right now, we've only got one thing that we can use to take care of people with a lot of pain, and that's an opioid of one kind or another. They're really, yeah, they're, I, there are NSAIDs, there's, you know, acetaminophen, Tylenol, et cetera, et cetera. And, and those are okay for mild or even moderate pain, but when people are in a ton of pain, it's just really not going to work. All right, so this is a good place for us to break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk more. We're going to talk about more about like where the money comes for this research. We've got a lot of things we want to talk about, not that much time, so I'll shut up. Medicinally, Therapeutic cannabis, plain old doctor's pot. You can call it pharmaceutical ganja, or dress it up as Red Cross grass. The medical marijuana will knock you on your ass. Some politicians condemn us, they say we're really not that ill. 
These shops in their neighborhood take the property values to hell. And while your investment banker might fit that criminal scan, one split from the neighborhood medical store will keep them happy at the ice cream van. <laughs> Like the old shops in Amsterdam, the flavors are extreme. Diesel and brain honey and space cake give you happy dreams. Jamaican seeds, Alaskan dirt, it's so multicultural. It will give you back your appetite. Twinkies are natural. Oh, medical marijuana. Medicinal weed. Pharmaceutical ganja, or dress it up as Red Cross grass. But medical marijuana will knock you on that lovely ass. Oh, medical marijuana, medicinal weed, therapeutic cannabis, plain old doctor's pot. You can call it pharmaceutical ganja, or dress it up as Red Cross grass, but medical marijuana will knock you on your way. So let me just tell you who's here. I'm going to do short introductions, or the show really will be over. James Feeney, Director of Trauma at St. Francis Hospital and Medical Center. Uh, Godfrey Perlson, Director of the Olin Neuropsychiatry Research Center at the Institute of Living and Hartford Hospital and Healthcare. Uh, Stacey Gruber, the Director of uh, Cognitive and Clinical Neuroimaging Corps. Uh, she is um, also an Associate Professor at, um, of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. And uh, Suzanne Sisley, Internist and uh, President of Scottsdale Research Institute in Arizona. Okay, so... Um, James, I'm going to go right back to you. You ended the last segment, but so, but I just want to go from there to just money. All right. Okay. So here you're doing this thing, which really, I mean, if it turned out that marijuana was as good or almost as good or sometimes as good as opioids for treating, you know, the kind of pain that you're looking at right now, particularly the kind of trauma pain and stuff like that. That's like a really big deal, you know, and in terms of what I assume our federal drug policy is, you'd think, well, you know, that would be really great to get us a little bit out of the opioid business, maybe save some lives, avoid some addictions. I'm just assuming you're just being showered with federal research money. Yeah, I would have assumed that, too. I was hoping for that, but <laughs> fortunately it didn't happen. Um, the truth was we applied for several grants um, through several uh, agencies, some federal and some private, and uh, all of them politely declined. And, um, you know, the reason for that, as I, you know, as I heard from other people, was that, um, you know, this is a very risky time to do mar marijuana research, both politically, uh, given the current political climate, that we don't really know what um, the Justice Department is going to do with respect to uh, legalization of marijuana in states while it's still federal schedule one. Um, and, and also when it comes to, you know, just the fact that it still is a schedule one from a medical perspective, um, you know, um, just sort of funding that kind of research. So after uh, a fairly long period of time of trying to fund our research, you know, externally, what we ended up doing was sending up, setting up a foundation where the physicians um, from the trauma division over at St. Francis could donate money to fund the research ourselves. And that's what we did. That's what we ended up doing. We're, we're self-funding this research. If you want us to come over and do a pledge drive for you, we know how to do those. <laughs> we are experts. So um, you always get me. <laughs> that's right. So um, so Sue, I, I think I want to go to you next because I, I think one of the things that we we need to emphasize is that uh, sometimes you can get money, sometimes you can't get money. Sometimes you just have to drop, jump through a lot of damn hoops with a lot of people who want to maybe even kind of retexture the nature of your research in order to get the money. Is that uh, something that you've had s some struggle with? Yeah, that's a challenge that, you know, the folks who want to fund research often have a vested interest in the outcome. They want to see um, marijuana made to, you know, to look good. And, of course, we don't take money like that. We're not interested. We're 
committed to collecting objective data on how cannabis works or doesn't work, what are the you know risks and benefits, and so um, we don't want to. You know, I did for years. I've done pharma trials and. You know, there were many studies with big pharma that never saw the light of day because they didn't make their study drug look favorable. And so I'm very happy to be working for a nonprofit now where I don't have to, you know, we, we intend to publish all of the data, the good and the bad of cannabis will all be put into the public domain for everyone to scrutinize. But money has been a big challenge for us from the beginning. We've had the same um, struggles as the rest of these scientists where we've applied at all levels, state, federal, wherever we could um, find grant money. We couldn't um, ever acquire it until um, we got our first government grant um, two years ago, thanks to the state of Colorado, the generosity of these um, legislators who were willing to allocate uh, about $10 million to study efficacy of cannabis. So this was the first time we've really seen a, a significant amount of government money going to study efficacy only instead of um, doing the usual safety studies. That's traditionally what the government has funded is um, is safety studies looking at harmful side effects of cannabis or addiction potential of cannabis, which are all really important trials. But we would like to see the government provide more balance in the funding and start sponsoring efficacy studies on an equal playing field to the safety studies. <laughs> you think? I mean, I, to me, this is like another crazy thing. So NIDA, that's the group. You've heard so several people, NIDA, you know, you've heard, heard so several people on this show mention that. They're the people who decide which marijuana you can use, the old Miss marijuana or something like it. Um, you're saying that they don't fund studies of whether it works to do something? Well, traditionally they haven't. Um, only recently did we start seeing an RFP for, you know, cannabis for pain management, things like that. But small amount of money compared to the massive amount of taxpayer dollars that are spent to study safety. And so that's been a, a real challenge. It, we're, so we've been striving to identify private donors. That's really been our best hope is getting, you know, we've seen a lot of wealthy families come out of the woodwork, like the, the classic case, the Lambert family in Australia that donated $33 million to University of Sydney. Um, that's really our, our best hope is finding private donors that, that care about this issue, that aren't trying to manipulate the research in any way, that just want to see good science move forward. And that's incredibly um, valuable. But even having the state of Colorado, I think there's a lot of opportunities for these medical cannabis states where they're generating surplus funds from operating their medical cannabis programs. Even in Arizona, where I live, we have about, you know, over a $15 million surplus from just selling cards to medical cannabis patients, collecting licensing fees. You generate these surplus um, funds, and you, they could easily be earmarked for cannabis research to study efficacy, but unfortunately, that that's not usually what's happening. Typically, they're, those funds are getting swept into the general fund to pay for other things. All right, so I just want to hear the other two uh, funding stories quickly. So Stacey Gruber, rather than have uh, people tell you what to do, you're privately funded, right? So the MIND program at this point is privately funded, yeah. And, and you know, like my colleagues, we've certainly explored other options. This is really the very best option because it's it's really critical to deliver a completely unbiased set of data. That's that's the thing that we were all sort of desperately in need of. And, you know, that you, you really can't be in a position to change your design or change, you know, your outcome variable depending on the agenda of a potential funding source. So that's that's important. And just, you know, sort of to, to echo the sentiments, I mean, you have 90% of states, 28 states plus D.C. have fully legalized medical cannabis. Another 16 have limited cannabis, right, non-intoxicating or non-psychoactive as we often hear it referred to as like cannabidiol-only states. So you would think that states would want to take <laughs> a big section of that surplus and um, allocate it for research and development to sort of underscore the efforts that are being made. But um, it's slow to come, I think. All right. So, um, Godfrey Burson, you actually got a federal grant. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, tell us about that. Okay. So, um, th the grant that we got from the National Institute on Drug Abuse is to study the neuroscience of cannabis-impaired driving. Mm -hmm. So, w what we do is, um, well, to, to get into the how long did we have to wait until we actually got cannabis after the grant was funded, mm. it was about a year and we went through three federal agencies and we had to build a special room 
with a 24-hour security camera, an electronically armed mechanical safe sunk into a rod that goes three feet into the floor and can withstand a limited nuclear blast. No, I'm kidding about that part. So th- there are many hoops to jump through, but the, the, the study is, is funded by NIDA, and uh, it's looking at n- 90 individuals who are either occasional or regular smokers of cannabis. And they come in on three separate occasions, and w- we're blind as they are as to uh, what they're taking from the vaporizer. They're given an acute dose that would be equivalent to either a strong, medium, or weak, i.e. placebo joint. And repeatedly, they have to go into the MRI scanner and drive in virtual reality, Mm -hmm. flat on their backs, but we train them to do that. They come out and drive on a high-end driving simulator. They're given a bunch of cognitive tests. We continually take saliva and blood samples to look for THC and its metabolites. And then rinse and repeat over the course of an eight-hour day. So we're interested not only in acute impairment, but when it wears off and Mm -hmm. under what circumstances relationship of blood levels of these drugs to um, to driving impairment and cognitive impairment. So um, I want to we're going to come back to some of this kind of how it plays out in the field of public policy in the final segment. But, you know, James Feeney, I want to come back to something that you said, which was that um, nobody's really sure what the attitude of the Justice Department is going to be or you know, any of the other aspects um, uh, uh, of the Trump administration. I don't know. I think you could be somewhat sure. Anyway, I'm going to read you a quote. I'll try to read it uh, in the appropriate uh, voice. I reject the idea that America will be a better place if marijuana is sold in every corner store. And I am astonished to hear people suggest that we can solve our heroin crisis by legalizing marijuana so people can trade one life-wrecking dependency for another that's only slightly less awful. Our nation, nation needs to say clearly once again that using drugs will destroy your life. That, of course, is Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General. Uh, <laughs> and a very good imitation of him, I might have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I practice in front of the mirror. But, um, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know. How much of a message do you need? I mean, it seems like it, obviously the Obama administration wasn't, like, dealing with this with open arms. You know, I mean, it's they, they had a chance to not make a Schedule One. They didn't do that. Right. But this this seems like a very different tone of voice. And I, if I were a research institution, I may be a little nervous. Well, I, I think you're right about that. And, I, I, you know, that, that statement that I'd be astonished to hear that, you know, medical marijuana might reduce the heroin epidemic or the opioid epidemic, I would really love the chance to astonish, um, you know, uh, Mr. Sessions. Because I, I think that, you know, the, when the data comes out, we may find exactly that. I mean, there's certainly a fair amount of anecdotal data that a lot of people who are addicted to opioids who go into medical marijuana programs stop taking opioids as a result. And there's also a fair amount of anecdotal data, again, that in states where medical marijuana is made legal, the opioid problem seems to recede. So I, 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 don't, think it's, I don't think it's beyond the pale to, to look at it and to study it because we're never going to know you know, with, with all due respect to Mr. Sessions, uh, I, I don't really feel like, you know, his his uh, gestalt on this might might be all that accurate. Well, Stacey Gruber, I'm also wondering whether this is toothpaste that can, that can be gotten back into the tube. I mean, in a way, marijuana has a certain status in our society. Medical marijuana, as you just pointed out, Stacey, has a certain status uh, in our society and has gained certain ground in our society. Um, and it's kind of like gay marriage. Once everybody realized that they all knew gay people, you know, they got a lot cooler about gay marriage. Um, and everybody now knows somebody who is maybe benefiting from marijuana, uh, from medical marijuana. So I don't know. I mean, Jeff Sessions can say what he wants. That doesn't necessarily mean, mean that he's going to call the tune at the square dance. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, you know, it, it's a little bit of a wait and see time at the moment. But you're right. I mean, the nation is certainly warmed toward the idea of marijuana as medicine. We see this every day with the growing numbers of people who are registering. And then there's countless more who aren't registered who are using, you know, products that don't have to come through a dispensary. So I think there's every reason, you know, to be to be hopeful. And, you know, I absolutely agree with Jeff. And Some of our data is incredibly compelling. People are sort of abandoning their opiate-based medications in favor of cannabis. And while, again, some of these sample sizes are small, they're incredibly promising. And why, w- why shouldn't we embrace something that may help us literally turn the tide with regard to this epidemic that we're facing? So 
every reason to be hopeful. Or don't even embrace it. Just study it. Yeah. Just let, let us study, study it. it. Let us study it. Exactly. All right. We're going to grab a quick break here. Uh, we've got a great panel here. This has been fascinating stuff. I wish we had two hours. We don't, but we'll uh, get as much done in the final segment as we can. Because way back in the 60s, this could never have been. But local politicians and some others we know, I guess they put it on the ballot, then you all turned out to vote. Oh, my. Mine, 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 mine. Doing good. Hoped I would. Medical marijuana's got me feeling just the way that I should. In all this scientific research, I want the answer to only one question Is Dave here or is Dave not here? Today's show is produced by Betsy Kaplan and me, Kyone Wolf, Amanda Fish, Split a Brownie with Maureen Dowd. Our intern is Ali Oshinsky, and the part of Bill Curry was played by Willie Nelson. Check out photos of medical marijuana on the Colin McEnroe Show Facebook page. And now, back to Colin. So one of the uh, people who I believe testified, and I'm not going to reintroduce everybody because it'll take too long, but uh, so Godfrey Perlson, one of the people who introduced, uh, uh, who uh, testified is, uh, I'm sure, a name and maybe even a person well known to you, D- uh, Dr. Deepak D'Souza, a Yale University professor in psychiatrist. He's testifying against the bill. One of the things that he says seems kind of germane to your study. He says driving on crowded highways like I-95 is already difficult. Quote, driving on I-95 with people who are stoned is a very bad idea. So, and I'm not asking you to say whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. I guess what I'm asking you to say is when I read about, say, Colorado or Massachusetts or any any place considering legalization, you know, my question is, like, uh, look, drunk drivers are horrible and they kill people every year and it's it's a mess. But there's at least a field sobriety test and then blood alcohol levels and some kind of way of assessing how damn drunk you are while you're driving your car. I feel like we don't know too much about, we don't have a chorus. Do we have a corresponding set of data points about pot? No, that's a great question because we absolutely don't. And there are a number of complications. One is on the behavioral side, it's clear what uh, alcohol intoxication does to people. They stagger about, um, their memory and coordination is affected, and those are things that are readily tested at the roadside. With marijuana, it's much less clear what the corresponding behaviors are. With alcohol in your blood, it dissipates at a predictable level and is easily measurable through a breath or a blood test. The problem with THC, which is the main intoxicant in in smoked marijuana, is that it's incredibly fat soluble. I mean, it is a fatty substance. And it's immediately sucked out of your blood into body fat, including in your brain. So if the, the police pull someone over and get a THC level, it's going to be low, no matter when they smoked. But that low level can represent two things. It could be that you're a frequent smoker and you last smoked 10 days ago, but your level THC level is still up because it's leaching out of your body fat. Or it could mean you're an occasional smoker and you last smoked 10 minutes ago. And there's currently no way to tell the difference between those. So those two major things bedevil mm-hmm. roadside testing. Uh, I'm going to kind of speed date through a whole bunch of little topics here because we have so little time left. And, and so, James, this isn't really your field, but I'm guessing since you're, the people in your studies are coming in from dispensaries, maybe you have like some anecdotal sense of it. My sense is it's actually pretty – I mean, it's not like something that my, you know – Blue Cross policy is going to cover, right? I mean, and Lori Mack, who's reporting on this for us right now and on the proposed tax, says, you know, there's like a buy-in somehow or other, like the uh, physical you got to go through and stuff you got to do to get the card. That could run around 250 bucks. And then she found patients who were spending as much as $900 a week on this uh, on this stuff. I mean, if you want to use medical marijuana, it's not necessarily cheap, I guess. No, I think you're exactly right. I mean, for the study purposes, that's what the study, that's the only thing the study really needs to fund. Um, there's not much else, honestly, because we're not really doing anything else except seeing, you know, observationally how people are doing. But you're right. I mean, I think your numbers are right on. We we, we figured probably about a thousand dollars over six weeks per patient uh, to pay for this. And uh, you know, right now, insurance companies aren't going to pay for it. Once they started paying for it, and once it became something that got to be mass produced, the prices would go uh, way down because there's it, it's it's not like something that you need a lab uh, to really be able to grow. 
So, Stacey, I feel as though I'm going to go, go back to that kind of um, cash 22 thing that you and I talked about or the double bind. You've actually been studying the effects of marijuana use for a really long time. But I feel like the United States hasn't been studying the effects of marijuana use for a really long time. So, I mean, obviously, there's a conversation we can have about medical marijuana where you guys just, as I think James said, just let us study it. You know, that makes total sense to me. But legalization, it seems like, I mean, is there enough actual clinical data about marijuana? to know, to, to make the kind of policy judgment that people have to make? So I, I think it's a, it's a great question, and I always like to say policy has definitely outpaced science in a number of areas, mm-hmm. um, but there's every reason, again, to sort of allow the what we know, and that should also include anecdotal information. You know, as we heard earlier, there's an awful lot that people and patients will tell you about their use of medical cannabis, and again, you know, not to mix apples with oranges, medical cannabis, recreational cannabis, different. And we should probably really be thinking of them in very, very different ways because they look different and their indications for use, these consumers, these patients, very, very different. So, you know, I, I, I think it's the kind of thing where we, we absolutely need more data. And we're hoping, you know, with studies like these and, and these, all these folks on the panel, this is always very, very helpful to try to flesh some of these things out so we can move it forward. Yeah. So, uh, Sue, I mean, and I think maybe to that point, it's worth emphasizing, no study exists in a vacuum, right? The the knowledge is a compendium, an accumulation uh, of clinical studies, of clinical knowledge. So right now, I mean, if you want to study the efficacy of medical marijuana uh, in treating veterans with PTSD, um, you know, you want to study the efficacy of it. But I guess you also want to know the risks versus the benefits, too. And is that all part of your study, or do you need other people's studies to say, maybe look at the risks? Now, we're lucky that we're able to study both um, safety and efficacy within the same trial. So that's part of what we strive for is to always have a balance. We realize this is a drug like any, it's got risks and it's got benefits. So we always strive to look at both and collect data in both areas. But but we were informed um, by tons of other observational studies and case series that, that has occurred over the last few years. So there's actually a tremendous amount of published literature about cannabis for PTSD. Um, it's just that we've never had a single randomized controlled trial looking at this issue. So this will be the first and only randomized controlled trial in the world looking at cannabis for PTSD. But I, I also wanted to touch on what the other folks were saying about, you know, and, and you'd asked about policy and how, you know, I, I think we're, I wanted to bring a couple hopeful points here that we're, we've seen a big breakthrough in January with the National Academy of Science report um, where they, you know, the, it was titled The Health Effects of Cannabis and the Current State of Evidence, and they basically analyzed all the published literature they could find on cannabis, maybe over 10,000 studies that they reviewed, and they found conclusive evidence that marijuana can be used as a medicine. It identified three areas that cannabis had a, you know, a significant amount of scientific evidence to support its use. So I think that was a, a, um, a game changer because it's a very respected federal agency, the National Academy of Science, and hopefully that will inform public policy down the road. Yeah, I mean, it's true that we, we desperately need more controlled trials, but there's already uh, an immense amount of scientific literature published in many peer-reviewed journals um, confirming some of the therapeutic benefits of cannabis. It just needs to be, you know, we need to continue digging and uh, seeing the government hopefully loosening some of the restrictions on these studies. All right. So we've only got about a minute and change left. I dare not ask any scientific investigator a question that only has one minute left to answer it. So I'm going to thank once again James Feeney from St. Francis Hospital uh, and uh, Godfrey Perlson from Institute of Living in Hartford Hospital, Suzanne Sisley from the Scottsdale Research Institute in Arizona, uh, Stacy Gruber, who wears many hats, uh, including, well, you're ma- are you mainly at McLean? Is that where you are, mainly? I am. Yeah. So mainly at McLean in Belmont, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, and I want to thank Betsy Kaplan, who's the person who put this whole thing together. Uh, she did, as usual, an excellent job of preparing me. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. Out of breath, I am left hoping someday I'll breathe again I'll breathe again I'll breathe again
Lydia, I know you've been having problems with anxiety and getting enough sleep and stuff. So if you want, you can try some indica. It's a strain of marijuana that... Oh, no. I'm just not comfortable with that. That's pot. That's not okay. That was worth a shot. If you want, I can lend you my other vaporizer. It's It's got this all-natural, organic, Connecticut-grown herbal extract. Some people say it helps with their stress, but you know it's herbal, so you never know if it's really going to... Sounds great! Pfft. <sighs> 